I have the privilege of uh, speaking to you today. And uh, for those of you who've been tracking with our daily Bible reading plan, I want to um, take us back to something that we've read um, perhaps just last week. And it is in 1 Samuel, the story of Israel's first king. Pretty good looking dude. His name was Saul, won the hearts of his people because he led them into victory and they sang, Saul killed his thousands. And then there was the whole Goliath story and uh, nobody will face him. This little guy by the name of David, which is a beautiful name, by the way. (laughs) The guy by the name of David comes along, um, has a heart towards God, and God uses him to slay Goliath. What did he earn as a result of that? His family wasn't just blessed. He got to marry the king's daughter. But here's the problem. King Saul started to hear a different song being sang. And it was David killed his ten thousands. He didn't like that very much. Here's David beginning to eclipse the king. Even though he was married to his daughter, that was his son-in-law, he grew in envy and with rage. Pastor reminded us a couple weeks ago that uh, this got so out of control. Saul actually will throw a spear at David to try to kill him. And if you thought that was bad and dysfunctional, Saul got so mad at David. One day, David goes to this village. He walks up to a priest. The priest says, David, what are you doing here? Saul is trying to kill you. And for that brief conversation that David had with the priest, Saul finds out, Saul wipes out the entire village. A bunch of priests live there. He killed everybody just because you were associated with David. No, that's some rage. Now, the table will turn. Saul is after David, and David has an opportunity to take Saul's life. And he decides out of honor for his God and honoring the king, he was not going to take his life. Let's pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 26, verses 21. Then Saul confessed, having realized that David spared his life. I have sinned. Come back home, my son, and I will no longer try to harm you, for you valued my life today. I have been a fool and very, very wrong. Here is your spear, O king, David replied. Let one of your young men come over and get it. David wasn't going to go hand the spear to him. Do you blame him? The Lord gives his own reward for doing good and for being loyal, and I refuse to kill you even when the Lord placed you in my power, for you are the Lord's anointed one. Now may the Lord value my life even as I have valued yours today. May he rescue me from all my troubles. And Saul said to David, blessings on you, my son David. You will do many heroic deeds and you will surely succeed. Then David went away and Saul returned home. David responds to Saul in a way that's very contradictory to how Saul responded. to Saul wanted to kill him. David decided to spare his life. I believe David shows us a picture of what it means to love in a God kind of way. Today, I want to talk to you for a few moments, and I promise you just a few moments, on a message I've entitled, The Truth About Love. The Truth About Love. Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you for the privilege of being used by you. God, I thank you, God, that Holy Spirit, you're the one that teaches. You're the one that takes the word and moves on our hearts. God, as your word has pierced my heart, may it pierce our hearts together this morning. Holy Spirit, will you do what only you could do and give us a fresh revelation of the love that you have towards us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, everybody. Amen. Yes. Oh, by the way, why don't you help me welcome in those who are viewing online at another location today. We love that you're joining us in church this morning. Yes. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the works of a contemporary um, philosopher or philosophers who go by the name of the Black Eyed Peas. I've been studying some of their writings. One of their key works is entitled, Where's the Love? I want you to listen for a minute to the lyrics for one of the verses. 
It goes like this. I feel the weight of the world on my shoulder. As I'm getting older, people get colder. Most of us only care about money making. Selfishness got us following a wrong direction. Wrong information, always shown by the media. Negative images are the main criteria. They say, is, I changed the grammar. <laughs> Infecting the young minds faster than bacteria. Kids want to act like they see in cinema. Whatever happened to the values of humanity? Whatever happened to the fairness? inequality, instead of spreading love, we're spreading animosity. And one of my favorite lines from the song is this, the truth is kept secret. It's swept under the rug. If you never know truth, then you never know love. The truth, yeah. The truth is kept secret. It's swept under the rug. If you never know truth, you never know love. The truth is, is that you can never separate truth from love. As a matter of fact, if you're going to understand love, you have to go to the truth of God's Word. Jesus said He is the way, the truth, the life. And that's what we're going to do right now in these next few minutes. Say, God, would you show us your truth about love? Here's why that's important. If you don't understand God's definition of it, you're likely to base your understanding of love based on what you've seen, or based on what you've experienced in your life. And many of us have not had great examples of what it means to love in a God kind of way. As a matter of fact, for most of us, we kind of saw, do unto others as your mood would have it. <laughs> or, do unto others as long as it's convenient. How about this one? Do unto others before they do unto you. Or do unto others until you get them to see things your way. Many of us, it's been do unto others until you just can't do it anymore. Jesus raises the bar on love some 2,000 years ago. He gave us the foundation for having a loving, thriving relationship with each other. It is so simple but I want you to know it's counterintuitive to the way we think about love. It changes you. It changes what you think about love. And it's so profound, but it's so simple. You see, back in the Old Testament, God would send His Ten Commandments through Moses. Later on, it became over 600 plus laws that the people were trying to obey in order to please God and to know what He wanted them to do. Micah whittled it down to three. Jesus comes on the scene and he says, look, I want to make this abundantly simple. And he makes it one. A very simple principle about love. And he tells us in John chapter 13, verse 34, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You must also love one another. I give you a new command. New can mean remarkable. It can be extraordinary. It can be recently discovered. It is new in use, not in time. I give you a new command. What's the command? Love one another. Jesus gives us a command. Now, why is that startling? Because for many of us, we think of love as a noun or as an adjective. I feel loved or I feel like loving. Jesus says, it's a verb. Love is a verb, so he commands us to action love, to put love into action. He presents it as a verb, yes. And it's something you and I could actively pursue. That's why to those of us who are married in the room, a shout out for the married couples, the foundation for staying in love is to make love. Intentional pause, a verb. <laughs> the rest of you will get that later. <laughs> the foundation for any long-term thriving relationship is simply to follow the biblical definition, is to make love a verb. Then the feelings follow. Yes, love has feelings, but it always starts with the verb, and then God brings the feelings. You can only experience truth when it comes to love if you think of it as a verb. Love 
must be a verb. Let's say that together. Love must be a verb. Come on, let's do better. Love must be a verb. You guys did that very well. Jesus gave this command. 